Speaking of prayer, we're going to see Jesus pray. Okay, this is Jesus' prayer to the Father. The first five verses, he was praying for himself, and it was this beautiful conversation. And it says, Father, in my, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may be glorified. Right? And you, since you uh, have given me authority over all flesh, and uh, to give eternal life to, to all whom have called on you this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ in whom you've sent I glorified you on earth and have accomplished the work that you have given me to do now father glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed and I wanted to say that in this conversation that before the world existed and I started talking about this last week. When did, when did God choose you? Think of this this way, and maybe flipping it is, is when did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Oddly enough, when I was in December of two, uh, 1992, that's when I accepted Jesus my Lord and Savior. I remember it was in a Baptist church, Thailand Baptist church. My grandfather built the church and it was winter. There was snow on the ground and the water heater was broke. And I remember saying to myself, God, it's got to get better than this because this, this is not a good start. But uh, it was certainly invigorating. But that's, that was when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was 12 years old. But when did Jesus choose me? When did, when did Jesus choose you? As we see in this conversation with God and the Father, restores me to my glory that I once knew before the earth existed. And we're going to start talking. I'm not talking predestination stuff. I don't want to get that far. I don't want to get that, that deep and that theological. I don't want, what I want us to do is feel God's love for you. Because before anything was here, before the cowboy church was on this hill, before your grandparents and great-grandparents ever were, before God said, let there be light, he thought of you. He knew you. And, and think of that. Think of the magnitude of that. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God, right? But I also want you to think of it in this context. In the beginning, God knew you. Because what we tend to do in our, in our minds is we, we look at the life of Jesus, and we're fixing to see this unfold in John in the last part of the book, where we see Jesus in this kind of meek and this, this timid and this little bitty frail man that gets beaten, that, that, that gets spit upon, right? That gets, that gets people yelling at him and screaming at him and, and getting beaten to where he's unrecognizable. And he just sits there and lets all that happen. And we can look at it and we're like, man, this is this little timid God and this is our Savior. But I want you to understand the bigness of Jesus and the bigness of God. While we are still, still yet sinners, he died for us. As Revelation says, for the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Jesus died before the foundation of the earth was made. And we, as, as people that live in time, and this is all we have is time, we have a hard time wrapping our minds around this. Jesus was always there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And right in the, the beginning, he was there, and he was, he was crucified before the foundation of the earth. How can this happen? All I know is I can't get tomorrow or, or, or yesterday back, and I don't know what tomorrow holds. And we live in this life of time. And it's unfair. 
as we bury a 49-year-old man this week with a 34-year-old widow and his kids that won't get, they won't get to see their dad as they walk across the stage. That's not fair. Some of you guys are dealing with this in this room right now with some real pain and real, real suffering. It's just not fair. We live in a broken world. It's just broken. But I need you to hear, I need you to hear that this morning. Jesus chose you from the get-go. From the beginning. You're not a backup plan. You're not a what if. You've always been. You know, he knew you were going to be here in 2022 at Western Heritage Cowboy Church today for a purpose and a reason. And he has your, li your life ordained and laid out. Jeremiah 29, 11, do you know the plans I have for you? If he knows the plans that he has for you, then he has to know you. And he has to have chosen you for that plan. I need us to understand that and receive that this morning as we, as we break into the Word. God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for everyone that is here, God. We thank you for choosing us. Like, it is so, so beautiful to see, Lord, that when you choose us and you're with us and we, 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 we connect with you and we worship you and we serve you and we abide in you and we obey you, God, that you are teaching us and you're more than anything loving us more than we deserve. And then on that last day, you say, well done, good and faithful. On the other side of the coin, there's others that will hear the words, depart from me for I never knew you. They choose simply not to acknowledge you. They choose a different path. They choose a life that you've not planned. And that's where free will comes in, and that's where fallen men have come in. And God, you, your, your plan is that, that no one, no one go to hell. But free will is there. And God, I pray right now that as we break into the Word, you condition every heart to receive your Word this morning. You're glorified through the text. Lord, our prayer is as it is every week, that as we learn more about you, we fall more in love with you. Give us this time in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. John 15 says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask in the, Father, in, in, in the Father's name, he will give you. Or ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And, and he continues as we break in. This is Jesus' prayer for his disciples, the 11. He just understand that this morning. He's prayed for himself, as we just read. Now he's going to pray for the 11, and we'll see this language clarify that this morning as he breaks into to the Scripture. So I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. And again, these weren't men that were from the seminary. These weren't the scribes and the Pharisees. These were fishermen, tax collectors. There was a zealot. As a rebel, right? And, and, and these, these guys come together and form this amazing team. And, and it makes you, uh, I want you to understand that, that, that just because you didn't go to seminary, which I'm telling you this right now, seminary is great, it's fine, it taught me a lot of things. It's okay if I didn't go, but I did point I'm trying to make is God didn't choose me because I went to seminary. I started preaching at 17 years old, and then I went to seminary. 
I realized that God's put a calling on my life and I need to learn a lot more than I know. Right? But it was not, I need to go to the seminary and then get the calling. Okay? You, you know what God's called you to do. You know where God is leading you. Right? And, and that's great. And it has nothing to do with your education. Now, I will encourage you in this. Learn more. Grow in your knowledge. Okay? If you sit there and you don't read the book or the Bible because you have done that your whole life, you don't know enough. I'll tell you right now. I've heard pastors and preachers that, that stop studying. They just stop. They're like, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. I know what to do. I know what, to, I know what it says. No, you don't. I've been doing this for almost 30 years as a pastor, and I'm just scratching the surface of what God is showing me. Okay? Intensely studying the Word of God 40, 50 hours a week, and I still don't know enough. And here's the thing. When you hear somebody say, I know the Bible backwards and forwards, you should look them in the eyes and say, you're a liar. You know people that have said that. You know people. I know Scripture. Boy, I know Scripture. No, you don't. You may think you do, but that's pride and that's a lot of hooey. Excuse my French. Again, Jesus goes to these 11. We can go ahead and throw Judas in there, but he's gone. Out of the world. Peter might have been a great guy. He might have been a crook. He was a professional fisherman on the Sea of Galilee in a little bitty town of probably 50 people. Okay? And that's what he did. And Jesus goes to him. He says, drop your nets and I'll make you fishers of men. After the biggest catch that they've caught in, in their lifetime. Remember the nets were breaking and it was, it was so much. It would have been, they would have been on easy street for the rest of their life. With this, this call, with this catch. But yet, Jesus says, leave it all there and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they did. And they did. Matthew, first gospel that we have, right, is, is hated. He's a tax collector. Nobody likes, ta nobody likes the IRS even now. I got an amen out of that. <laughs> got an amen out of that. Right? So, that's what his job was. And yet God chose him. The men that you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. Right? And they have kept your word. And, and they had a hard time with this. If you remember, like, this says this, if the world hates you, understand it, it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus talking to um, his his 11, he says, and if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because <clears throat> you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it. Again, the word chosen there, the world hates you. The world hates you. So, continue, Romans 8 says this, but God proves his own love for us while we are still yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's another translation, but you get the, the text. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Now back into John 17. Now they know that all things have been given to me are from you. And they didn't know that for a long time. Like they couldn't figure it out, even though that they've been with Jesus, they've been studying with Jesus, they've been learning under him, and they've been seeing all the miracles and all these great things, right? But they couldn't figure it out until the very end, chapter 16. He says, because, uh, we're, we're still in, in 17, but I'll get to that point. Because the word that you gave me, I've given them, right? I've been pouring into these guys. I have received them. And have known for certain that I came from you. They know that Jesus came from God. They have believed that you sent me. And again, that is the whole point. That's what separates Judaism from Christianity. 
is they've come to the decision that Jesus Christ was sent from God and is the Messiah. And they know that. Remember, if you remember in this, this text, this is chapter 16, the disciples are there and they says, Ah, now you're speaking plain, plainly, right? Not using figurative language. Now we know that you are everything. And, and, and don't need anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. Ah, I get it. Now, as soon as that's over, Jesus goes into prayer. And he confirms that as we've just been studying. He's like, I've teaching them, I've been pouring into them. They know everything. I have not hidden anything from them. And then I pray for them. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for, the, for, for those you have given me. Because they are yours. And again, what are these guys going to do? What are they going to do? Look at what they had they, they, that's coming up. Jesus already has looked at Peter and says, you're going to deny me three times before morning. And he does. And then they scatter, right? Jesus is, is fixing to be captured. He's fixing to be brutally murdered and everything. And, and they're gone. Gone. Scatter. And Jesus says, I'm praying for them. I'm praying for them because they're, what they're fixing to endure is going to be tough. But yet, look what happens. And Jesus and, and his glory and his amazing uh, uh, presence after that third day, that Sunday morning, Jesus pops out of the grave and he meets with them, right? Remember the conversation with him and Peter, right? Peter denies him three times. Jesus asks the question to Peter after the resurrection, do you love me three times? Feed my sheep, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep, right? And, and, and then there's, there's this conversation with Thomas, and Thomas, he just touch me. I'm real. And then they watch as Jesus ascends into heaven after 40 days. And they watch him just go. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And they have this empowerment from the Holy Spirit, which he told them was going to happen, where they could start speaking and teaching in the upper room. right? And, they, and then the Holy Spirit just comes in and just blows everything away. They have so much power and authority. Peter is literally walking by people and his shadow is so powerful that people are healed. Thousands are being added to the church daily. In fact, they have to get a group of people together, the seven in Acts, and these apostles get together and say, look, our job is to teach and preach, and y'all need to run the church and, and let us do our thing and go evangelize. And, and so the seven come together, and that's where Stephen gets involved. And, and, and they go, and they go throughout the world teaching and preaching the gospel. Peter and James, the brother, which is not a disciple, but he is the brother of Jesus, stays in Jerusalem, and they teach and preach and build the church. If you ever want to learn a whole lot about James, read the book of James. It's amazing. Camel knees, they called him, because he was constantly on his knees praying. And then the others were out throughout the world, teaching and preaching, dying martyrs' deaths. All of them, except for John, the author of this book. But he's saying, I'm praying for them. Because, you know, here's the thing. Other than John, who lives over 100 years old, all of them are, are in their last days as well. They, they, they're fixing to be murdered. They do a lot of amazing works, but yet it's going to be an end. In fact, Peter looks at the cross and he says, oh, I've longed for this. That's crazy to think about. He goes to the cross, oh, cross whom I've longed for. And he says, I'm not worthy to be hung like my Savior. Hang me upside down. That's the prayers that Jesus is pouring into them right now. I'm not praying for the world, but the, for those you've given me. Because they're yours. And again, everything I have 
is yours. And Jesus gives it right back to the Father. That's why you can never separate Jesus and God. They will always be forever together. Everything I have is yours. And everything you have is mine. Right? My wife tells me all the time, what's yours is mine and what mine is mine. Right? It's not so with this. It's everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine and we're together and we're connected and it's, it's this beautiful connection and, and relationship. I am not withholding anything from you. You are not withholding anything from me and I have been glorified in them. I underline that. He, he, he knows how weak they are. He knows how, how their struggles are. But look at the last line before he starts praying for the Christians. He says, I have been glorified in them. We saw a little bit of that. I, I, I ask you to live a life according that's worthy of the gospel and this right here, that you glorify Jesus in your life. That your life exudes Christ to where when people see you, they see him. Sounds real easy. It's really hard sometimes, right? It's really hard a lot of times. I, I don't want to get too far because, again, we're going to start talking and preaching and, and, and praying for the, for, the, for the church. But I want you to watch this video about how God chooses us from the beginning. He chose you. I, I, I also want to do this um, last little bit. My, my son is running cross country um, in high school. 
and and love watching him run. Um, but this year's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. It's been hard for him. He's he's not. He's you know he's as big as I am now. So it's you know he's learning how to to navigate through life. You remember that when you were, were you know grew and you didn't and you couldn't chew gum and walk at the same time. Um, but we had a real heart to heart the other day because you know. I, I see greatness in him, right? Like your kids, you, like you see greatness in your kids, right? Um, and you want them to just um, succeed and, 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 and do uh, abundant and, be, and, and just do amazing things. But one of the things that we've had a conversation about is, is almost like the definition of insanity, right? You keep doing the exact same thing and you expect something different. And so what I've challenged my son with is this uh, year, and I think God has just spoke to me uh, in my prayer time this week. But the things that I've, I've to- I tell him, I, I tell him this: I say, you, if you want to do something different, right? If if you want to, because he wants to go to state, okay? He wants to go to state. If if you want to succeed in this, you've got to do something different than what you've been doing. Okay. If you want to succeed in 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 this cross country, it's going to take more of an effort. And this is what I say: in order for you to do things that you've never expected or never seen before, you have to work harder than you've ever had to work to do it. Okay. And listen to my heart because this is how we'll tie this in spiritually speaking. Not that we have to work for our our faith or anything like that. But what we have to do is if you want to experience something different in the Lord, you cannot keep doing the same exact thing. Right? I'm talking to a bunch of people that don't like change. Okay? But here's the problem. Change is going to happen whether you like it or not. And what happens as, as Christians and believers is if we, go, we keep going and we do something different for a little bit and then we grow and we learn and it's uncomfortable, but then we get kind of plateaued. Right? And this is a level, and we're okay with that. And, 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 but we are comfortable there. But we stop growing in the Lord, and we stop growing in our faith. We stop growing in the knowledge. And so what we have to do is find another uncomfortable spot. Maybe it's praying in the morning where before you'd never do that, right? Or maybe it's studying the Word of God uh, on a Tuesday afternoon where you've not, never done that before. Maybe it's talking to, you know, your brother or sister that are going through something that's not comfortable. But it's something that where you have got to go and you've got to grow. In order for you to go somewhere you've never been for before, you have to do some things you've never done before. Understand my heart? Here's a better way of saying this. If you want to get if you want God to get real with you, you got to get real with God. Whatever that looks like. And some of us are very comfortable where we're at. And and I'm challenging you and then challenging you in that don't don't be comfortable. Okay? Be comfortable in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that he's, he is your Lord and your Savior and you have eternal security. Be comfortable in that. But don't be comfortable in the Great Commission. Somebody else will save them. That's Russ's job. That's Bodie's job. That's, you know, that's somebody. No, 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 no. Well, Russ tells me everything I need to know. If I'm the only information you get about Jesus, whoa. That's scary on the surface, right? Right? Like... That makes me nervous for your salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? Because I, I love you. I love the Word of God, but I'm a fallen man with a bunch of issues. That's a polite way to say that. Who said amen? <laughs> In order for you to go somewhere you've never gone before, you've got to do things that you've never done before. And, and whatever that means to you, take that. So.